Yeah, okay guys, this is where we, we got off the train in uh, the Hauptbahnhof and got in a taxi on a rainy Hamburg night. Um, we drove around, to the, around the corner here and the guy stopped here and we, we thought, where's the club? He says, down there. Get all your stuff down, your baggage and your guitars and drums and everything. And here's the, the, the back door. And you go through there, and you have a sausage, a bockwurst, and you have a beer, and then you start playing. So we started playing and we, we didn't stop for months. So this is where it all started, in this place down here, the Kaiser Keller. Yes, it's a long time ago. It's like 43 years. Yesterday, of course, yesterday. Yeah, that's where it all started. It was hard work, very hard work for very little money. We were like slaves. Yeah. Very hard work. But we loved it because we wanted to get on the stage and play. Because in England there was no way we could play all night and get money. But here we could play all night and we got some money, a little money. And we slept in a hole with no air. Who needs air? We had beer, we had music, we had each other. Rock and roll. That's the same noise as the old days. You hear that? It's a little early. Oh yes. Thank you very much. The thing about the Kaiser Keller in those days was there was no air, there was no ventilation. So we were playing in this big cloud, a permanent cloud. Everybody smoked in those days. Everybody smoked. But this was a very rough place. You know, people getting kicked and hit and blood and fists, you know, and boom. Uh, I just, uh, I was on the stage playing and somebody was getting killed down here and I was, I just went, I put my closed myself up and just carried on playing. I didn't see anything. Rock and roll, man. But uh, this was a violent place in those days because all the kids, you know, from the wartime, like I'm a wartime child too. So the German wartime kids, they were no different. They had problems, psychological problems and aggressive, very aggressive. So we were, uh, being musicians, it was uh, easier to stay alive, you know, because if you play, people like you, because everybody likes music, even the bad people like music, even the gangsters, they like music. So we had everybody on our side. But I got, I got a new nose too, I got... I got hit too, jealous guys, because the girls liked us. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, you are now standing in the Star Club. There is a stage over there. There's a wonderful group banging away, making a lot of noise, too loud, of course. And the people in the church are worried about the, you know, the vibrations. And, well, this is the Star Club, but I'm afraid after all these years, this is the only thing left. A piece of granite from India, very wonderful granite stone. Yes, and here we have the very famous Gretel and Alphonse, which is the same as it was in the old days. Nothing has changed. It's just the way it was. And this is the pub where all the musicians used to come out of the Star Club. It was not far to go, so we came out of the Star Club and we went in here. And we had a few beers and had a talk and talked about the music and uh, blah, blah. And... Uh, came out again and went back in the Star Club and played again. So we were sort of going like this, you know, all night. This way, that way. But this, this is where we lived in the daytime when we weren't playing. So really we slept up there, we played there, and this is where we had our beer and also sometimes something to eat in here. 
And the boss is the same guy, Horst, he's still the, the same man. So nothing has changed. This is the only place which hasn't changed since 1960-62. Gretel and Alphonse. That's it. That's where John Lennon went to the toilet and didn't come out for half an hour. You know, everything was coming out and put it back in again. That was normal in those days. Yeah, in those days, of course, all we wanted to do was make a record. Any record. Just go in the studio and make a record. And we made a record. We made uh, a single with the Beatles called My Bonnie. My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. And I went next door to the music store, which is not there anymore, and I bought my own single, five marks. I paid five marks for my own single. Now I came in here and I was looking at my single, you know, look at it, feeling it. This is my first record. And it was my Bonnie. Very strange version. Because Bert Kempford said, we got to play something that the Germans know. Because the kids learn at school, you know. My Bonnie lies over the ocean. My bunny lies over the ocean My bunny lies over the sea My bunny lies over the ocean Why don't you bring back my bunny to me? That was the introduction in A. Now we did a very innovative thing. We went into C. Rock and roll. My bunny lies over the ocean. My bunny lies over the sea. My bunny lies over the ocean. Why don't you bring back my bunny to me? Everybody was singing. Bring back. We were rocking and rolling and every night playing the same shit and to me, to me. Hey, bring back, oh, bring back, bring back my bunny to me. Then this fantastic solo I used to do. How did it go? etc. It went on and on. And the thing in those days was most of us played guitar. There were other instruments but the guitar was the easiest to learn and to play rock and roll all you need is three chords and you can sing most songs. Play most songs. <coughs> but there were a few of us who wanted to do more than that so we put some strange chords in and we played it differently every time. Any song we did we played it differently. So this version of My Bonnie that you hear on the record with the Beatles was only one of two or three we did in the studio. The others have gone, they, they were lost. So we never did the same song twice. And that kept us from falling down from boredom. And in the afternoon, we'd sort of show each other some new things, you know, how do you do that? How do you play that? Little blues, we had a lot of blues thing going. It wasn't just rock and roll, but blues, folk, ballads, everything. But really we lived for the music. That's all we wanted to do. Just play and play and play. That's what we did. Play. Okay, okay, this is Cafe Miller. 
and this is where we used to have tea not you know a glass of hot water and a tea bag of course we always used to have two tea bags to make it taste English and there was a jukebox like this and the music in the jukebox in those days was a bit of Elvis a bit of Chuck Berry a bit of Buddy Holly and German singers as well we didn't understand any German in those days but we had people like Peter Krauss and Ted Harold Peter Alexander and Freddie Quinn was the biggest guy. He was like singing these seaman songs and, and the people loved him. He was a big star. And then, of course, we came with our authentic sounding rock and roll and playing around the corner, up the top ten, etc. And all of a sudden we were seeing Elvis was in there and, uh, you know, lots of other people who weren't there. Bob Dylan was in there, you know, people that we, we, who hadn't been in there before because the taste of the people was changing. It was not only the German stuff and, and uh, what they call Schlager, it was sort of rock and roll as well. So it was American and German and, and English all mixed up. And I, th I think we had a lot to do with changing people's tastes because the revolution of uh, playing eight hours a night and uh, every night for months on end, this had to change something. And what it did, I think, was to open the ears and eyes of, of young kids especially, that uh, something was going on and things were coming to Germany maybe two years late, later than anywhere else. So we brought American music, if you like, to Hamburg. And of course we were just copying at the beginning. You know, we were listening to the record and, and copying what we heard and playing it on stage again, reproducing it and not being original. But after a while, we discovered that the German public didn't mind if we changed a few things, if we changed a few chords, we sang it in a different way. And of course, we used to play a song not 2 minutes 25 seconds, we used to play one song sometimes 15 minutes long. And in 15 minutes, you can do a lot with a, a song like What I Say. So we were changing the music. We were doing it on purpose too, it wasn't an accident. We, we discovered that you can make something original and authentic out of an old song by doing your own thing and putting your own energy into it, your own creativity and being innovative at the same time. And that, of course you don't get bored that way after playing eight hours a night for months on end. So the music that sort of came out of all this was sort of going back to Britain and uh, putting out some feelers and getting some roots and uh, the whole English music scene changed because of what was going on here because lots of musicians from England came through this school it's like a school a music school really and they learned to play all night and they learned to polish it up and become authentic and to become real all of a sudden and went back to Britain and knocked everybody out by doing what they learned here and from that sort of the British revolution the British music thing took off and part of that were, of course, the Beatles. Not only the Stones, the Beatles too. Um, I think without St. Pauli, the Beatles wouldn't have become what they were later, you know, like the hairstyles, because they went off to Paris one weekend and uh, with a photographer called Jürgen Vollmer. And when they came back, they had these funny hairstyles. And, uh, of course, they were not only new hairstyles, but they were also washed. The hair was clean. There was no cream in it and all that stuff. Previously, we all looked like the Elvis thing and uh, all trying to look like James Dean and, and Marlon Brando. But they came back looking very French all of a sudden and with a long scarf around your neck and everything. And this was not the rock and roll image. So something started here too. And uh, I think they just went to... Paris and brought back what was worth bringing back from Paris which wasn't a lot in those days because there was no rock and roll music nothing happening there except Edith Piaf and Johnny Holiday he was a, you can't you know he doesn't really count when it comes to rock and roll so what went on in Hamburg was more than just the music all of a sudden we were noticing people coming into the club older people and people with suits and ties with their ladies with their wives maybe with their daughters, I don't know, but they were respectable type people who normally wouldn't come to St. Pauli. They wouldn't even be seen here. But suddenly we're seeing, you know, the young kids and the 
exes with their long hair and the beards and the sandals sitting next to the guy who might be a, an attorney or something and he's a black suit a gray suit and they're all sitting in the club where we're playing and listening so we thought well this is a because in England there was not possible this sort of audience so we thought well something must be going on so uh, eventually of course Bert Kemford came in and uh, asked us to do a record <coughs> which we did of course and out of that my Bonnie came out and uh, you know it got the Beatles off the ground as well it helped to get them off the ground uh, later in Liverpool when they got their manager Brian Epstein so it's it you know we did some very strange things here I mean just to play eight hours a night every night for months on end it's a physical feat you've got to be like a you know like it's like sport you know you're banging away and sweating and a little beer to sort of and you sweat the beer out again and you have some cornflakes around the corner and have a cup of tea in here but basically what we what we did was transform everything we'd heard by the Americans the American music and made something new out of it uh, of course when the Star Club opened well all of a sudden they had people from the States the real thing you know Chuck Berry and Ray Charles, Fats Domino with a big band, all these black guys, like 20 black guys on the stage. So all of a sudden we did feel sort of a little bit inferior because we were still the second-hand players at that time. But at the same time we got to see our idols and down here at the Star Club there were people uh, we never would have seen normally. We, we would never have seen Ray Charles. Uh, uh, Gene Vincent, you know, people like that, our idols in those days, but here they were in our domain, playing next door. And I was playing with some of these guys too, so Gene Vincent is doing his crazy acts, like Ozzy Osbourne on stage, and I'm playing guitar for this guy, you know, on stage with him. And this is like a dream, you know, I'm playing with Gene Vincent. Wonderful, you know. So it was full of uh, the, the most ridiculous experiences and you couldn't even pay to get these experiences normally. But we, we just were here and we were just learning but because things were happening, it was moving. The whole uh, history of this area really doesn't, when, when you look back, it, it doesn't last longer than seven years. From 60 to 67, I think then uh, the whole thing sort of was going downhill again. Those seven years were probably the most productive for the music industry in Europe anyway, definitely in, in England, and uh, they changed society as well. They changed society here, definitely. It became salonfähig, as the Germans say, to go to the top ten on the Reaper Bar and take your wife and listen to the Beatles or listen to Tony Sheridan or listen to Jerry and the Pacemakers. Um, so. It was a sort of a little revolution going on. It made people think, well, these are not bad guys with the leather jackets playing rock and roll. There's something else. There's even singing nice songs sometimes. A lot of ballads and stuff like that. And sooner or later, you know, of course, uh, the jukeboxes like this were full of other music, not only the German stuff. And this went down to the Frankfurt and Munich but it all started here, so this was the center of beat at that time, if you like. And the, the impulses, the energy went all over the place, went to Holland, it went down to France, uh, it went, you know, all over Europe at that time, and back to Britain. So in Britain, uh, all the musicians were coming. The musicians who had talent used to play here all those long hours, and either they became good, very proficient, or they gave up. And lots gave up, lots of missions, they gave up because they couldn't keep up, you know, they, they, they saw that they didn't have what it takes. People like the Beatles, uh, they had the talent, and playing here all these, all these hours and months, they became good, they became better. Then they took it back to Liverpool and people went, wow, what happened? And you know, and you're looking clean now too, and all the rest of it, you know. So it had to do with the image, it had to do with the music, all that happened here. And the social thing too, the accept acceptable thing happened here. Music became acceptable, rock and roll. I'm a little bit proud of that too because I did my part every night, eight hours a night.
Terrible work. Bloody hell. Terrible money. No love. No food. Beer and play. Sir Pauli. And here we are again. I'm sitting here next to this jukebox. What's this? Al Martino. Who's Al Martino? Oh, a German name. I can't even pronounce it anyway. But uh, this place hasn't changed either. But society has. And I think we did a lot to help it along too. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tony Sheridan. You may not have heard the name. You may have. In connection with the old days here in Hamburg at uh, Star Club Top 10 with the Beatles, etc. With all sorts of groups, we made our first records here with, with the Beatles. And I was a singer in those days because John Lennon's voice had gone and Paul wasn't singing as well as he could have done at that time, but my voice was stronger and better. So I did this, the vocals with the Beatles on my Bonnie, etc. in those days, and I'm still going strong. You know, we were the first group to come over here and get things moving, and we changed a lot, you know, the, changed the kids, the way of thinking. Little revolution came into things. Uh, it was very important for something to happen here because, you know, because of the war and all the rest of it, something had to sort of, somebody had to come over and say, well, this is rock and roll and uh, we are the same as you and all this war shit is gone forever. Nobody needs all that stuff. You know, my parents, all our parents were, you know, they went wild when they heard we were coming to Germany. Anyway, but we, I went anyway. I broke my mother's heart. I broke my mother's heart by coming to Germany to the enemy to play rock and roll music and this is the place we came to this is the place I used to drink my tea in you know two tea bags in a hot a glass of water warm water this is the jukebox I don't know if it's the same one but similar of course in those days when you looked in the jukebox you didn't see Tony Sheridan you didn't see the Beatles you didn't see anybody like that you saw all sorts of German names which you couldn't pronounce of course that changed after our stay and part of my work I think in those days was to sort of make sure something happened here. Who knows, nothing might have happened but something did happen and it happened because of the music and because of the leather jackets and the hair and Elvis and James Dean and Brando and we brought all this over and we became sort of different people as well you know we started to wash ourselves you know and the Beatles went back looking clean and the Rolling Stones uh, even, uh, no, they still don't look clean. But you know, other people went back and um, it, everything changed in Europe. It brought everybody a, bit, a little bit closer together. And uh, I, I'm quite proud of my little part, which I played in those days. I'm still playing, of course, today. You should listen to my CD, Vagabond. Great songs. I wrote them all myself, you know. I'm one of these guys now who doesn't bother about a lot of publicity. Ozzy Osbourne and all that stuff, you know. No, I'm sort of, I don't know, somewhere in the corner, you know, at the side, in the shadows. And I'm still playing all my wonderful music, rock and roll, and my new songs too. So I've got another 45 years to go. You know, I'm young now, I'm still young. So the next 45 years, I'm going to change me. I've changed everything else, so I'm going to change me now. Thank you very much. Bye.